So that, I finished that in 92. While I was in school, I worked at the only regional theater in Los Angeles, which is the uh, LA Theater Center. And I met a couple of uh, established actors uh, that then when I was closer to um, finishing school, I saw in the LA Times that they had opened a theater. So I went and I hung out at, hung out at that theater uh, for the next five years-ish or so, and about maybe a year and a half in, we started a workshop on the weekends for those of us who were young. At that point, I hadn't done any jobs. I had done jobs, but no uh, legitimate TV or film jobs. Uh, I did not have an agent at that time. Um, and that workshop was for uh, young people such as that who were trying to formulate their process or what they do, the scene work and whatnot. And um, I did that until 96, and then I started trying to get a job. And I spent the next 30 years doing that until Texas Chainsaw Massacre happened. Uh, I was born in London, England. <laughs> My father was in the Navy, and uh, his base was in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Where we did My Bloody Valentine was just up the coast in Cape Britain, Nova Scotia. So it's kind of like returning home. Uh, I uh, fell into acting. I was uh, played rock and roll for many years in Quebec, a lot of bars and strip bars, and in pretty kind of rough uh, territory. And um, one day, a woman kept coming to our shows all the time, and. Uh, Long story short, she was directing Jesus Christ Superstar. So we did Jesus Christ Superstar. We put two bands together and did it in a in a festival. And I played Jesus, and uh, that was my uh, intro into acting. And um, after that, I had a call from a friend of mine who was uh, who was in the band with me, and his dad had passed away in a head-on-head -head collision uh, in the country. He was a farmer. He was coming from the curling rink, and my friend had a, a tow truck company in Montreal, and he said, do you think you could take care of this tow truck company while I was taking care of, while I was going to take care of the farm? I said, yeah, sure, I can do that for you. And one night I got a call about 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, and the guy was English on the other end of the phone. And he had dropped his car in a ditch on top of Mount Royal. And he was an actor, a British actor. <laughs> and he had taken this young ingenue, a young girl, uh, out on a date uh, to go necking up on top of the mountain in the middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> and so I drove the tow truck all the way up to the mountain, saw these lights like sky hiding up into the, into the clouds. And I was like, what the hell is that? And it was this big Buick stuck in the ditch. And he was in there with this little girl. And so I tied up the tow truck, pulled it out, and uh, on the way back, he says, drop the young lady off here. And I said, well, there's no metro, there's no subway. Oh, I gave her some money. She'll, she'll find a way back. Don't worry about it. And so uh, he seemed like an intelligent young man driving the tow truck back to where was, he, he lived. And uh, told him about Jesus Christ Superstar. He said, oh, here's my car. Actually, here, give me your pen. And he wrote on the back of the car, uh, the director of the National Theatre School of Canada. And so um, I dropped him off at uh, his street, and he wanted me to drop him off before his house. And I said, don't you want me to drop you? Oh, no, that's just fine. Just drop me off here. So he didn't want his wife to know that he was having an affair. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. So four months later, the card falls out of the glove compartment, and my, fun, my friend's ready to come back to doing his tow truck. And I called up. And long story short, I got into the National Theatre School of Canada. And into my second year, uh, I took fencing in school, and I was a carpenter, and all of this kind of stuff. And uh, I was six feet tall. So our sword master said, uh, there's this guy doing this film. Uh, I'd like you to come and, and meet him. And in the foyer in Montreal, you have these walk-ups, uh, brownstones. And I tripped over a goaltending stick and I picked it up and flipped it, as a goaltender usually does, to test out the weight of the stick. And uh, he rounded the corner and he goes, are you a goaltender? I said, yeah. He says, 
you're a goaltender? He says, yeah. Well, you got the job. Just like that. <laughs> wow. So I did, I did uh, a month and a half of uh, stunt work on my bloody Valentine and went back to classical Shakespeare training. I changed my name at the end of my bloody Valentine to Liam Blackwood. So there's my bloody Valentine credit and then all my credits for 20 years of acting under Liam Blackwood. So that's why people can never find me, uh, as I have another name. Now I build custom tree houses in Colorado, and I used to build high-end homes up in British Columbia, and I retired and went into uh, building tree houses. So that's what I'm up to now. Uh, I am Quinn Lord. I got into acting when I was about five years old. Uh, because I just memorized all the different books that you know, my parents were reading to me at night. Mostly uh, Dr. Zeus books like the Laura and stuff, so I'd better recite them, and I'd watch a lot of Indiana Jones and Star Wars just books, so really. Uh, and I'd just sort of reenact any of those scenes that I felt like at any moment, whenever they would like take me up any shopping mall or whatever. I'd uh, also, uh, not necessarily embarrass them, but sort of scare some people every once in a while by getting up into behind the um, behind the class in a um, clothing store there's like the mannequins and stuff I just sort of stand there <laughs> and as still as possible and it's, it's, it's the thing of people would not expect a child my age at that time about like five years old to actually have the discipline to stay that still but I did <laughs> just because I knew the payoff would be so good so of course I'd uh, scare some people that way uh, yeah, not, not everybody. But, uh, around the same time, uh, I just kept doing all these different uh, little things out in public. And uh, my parents eventually said, hey, let's uh, put them into like an improv class or something. So uh, they put me in there, and then uh, who was running the improv class ended up being a talent agent. And she said, okay, let's just put them out for some commercials or something. And the whole, it's like the second one that I ended up going for and getting. It's like, okay, well, let's just keep going and keep going. I got my first. Uh, I did commercials for a while, and then I got tired of smiling. So I did my first uh, appearance on a TV show. And I was just like, I see. I was just like a little vacation. I poked the doctor in the eye with my thumb. So that was good. But uh, not too long after that, it was maybe two projects later, I ended up making Trick or Treat. And that has been the gift that keeps on giving. This is <laughs> why I'm here, right? <laughs> yeah. So that, it was that early on, when I was about seven years old, I went to Trick or Treat. And that, that was, yeah. Well, not, not the end of it, obviously. I've been, I've been acting uh, since then. First movie was for So like your most recent, I believe, is a TV show with Elliot Brooks Scrubs, right? Well, um, uh, what TV show? Which TV show? Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, you know that. Oh yeah, I was on a couple of TV shows recently. Oh my gosh, that was Sarah Chalk. Was IMDb wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Entirely possible. Like <laughs> <laughs> we spent so much time looking these over at a time. Oh, now they've lied to us. I'm sorry. Well, anyway, is it weird when people recognize your face or not? <laughs> so it's starting to because I was in a TV show around 2015 or so. It was Amazon Prime, like their flagship show when it came out their streaming service. It was called Man of High Castle. It was one of the first um, noteworthy productions I was part of when my face was actually shown. Yes. So I had like a whole bunch of. Uh, well, Are you not in Oh, yeah, Firefly. Okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> oh, but, uh, <laughs> That's entirely part of it. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, um, it was. Um, yeah, my thinking. Georgia. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 
story I told you about that English guy. So the second job I got after my bloody Valentine was on a show called Snow Jobs. And this English guy played the major D to the chalet up in the Laurentians. And uh, I got a job as a playboy photographer <laughs> and girls in the snow country. And I went up to the craft table and there he was. And I said, hi, you remember me? Not in the foggiest. <laughs> <laughs> Mount Royal, big Buick, tow truck. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mum's the word. <laughs> well, I think you you build this forum as talking about the men behind the mask. So I'll just tell you, most of my work in my career is not in a mask. Um, and I just got lucky that I was cognizant of what a mask does to someone. So it, the, most people may or may not know this, but the Greeks are the ones that invented both acting and they used mask, masks also. And what happens when you put on a mask is that from the audience perspective, the person becomes a, a quote unquote every man or, or becomes almost universally relatable um, because of the blank face. So utilizing that is a big part of the way I was able to communicate in my particular example of this form, which is Leatherface, because um, two weeks into shooting, the producers came to me and said, you have to make this character sympathetic. Like, how are you going to make this character a chainsaw-wielding maniac with a history of nine films behind him into being sympathetic? He was never really sympathetic in the writing of any previous movie. Um, but so my my awareness of that Greek theater uh, convention of mask work was what allowed me to communicate certain things at certain times and to elicit a response such as in my movie if you're familiar with it Sally Hardesty comes into my room in a private moment leveling a shotgun to me and I basically disarm her with that look and, and a head tilt or whatever it was. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of stuff that you can do in a mask because it carries more weight than a person that doesn't have a mask. Same thing. So uh, I go up to the 14th century. It's called Camellia dell'arte which is Italian mask work, and I had already taken a year of that in school. So the director, who's a friend of mine now, George Mahalka, he's, because the, uh, the voltage in the, in the mines, we, we filmed 18 feet, uh, 1,800 feet below, and then two miles underneath the ocean. And the wattage had to be five watts. So the light that they had on my helmet was preamped by a huge battery that got changed out every 15 minutes. I uh, had four batteries. And so I, I had to tilt my head in such a way which gave an ominous sort of uh, feeling to, to the miner. And then I had to use it almost like a lighthouse and light the scene. So every time that light hit you, someone was going to die. And it was <laughs> immediate. There was no fooling around. There was no killing the person and looking at what you did. It was just kill and go. 
and so that worked out quite well. And I, I attributed mu much like mass work to what I learned in school, how to use your head, how to tilt it, how to angle it, and then just move on, get out of there. <laughs> well, when I was in mask, you know, <laughs> under that burlap sack on my head, uh, I was seven years old and I hadn't really gone through much schooling. So I was kind of figuring it out as I went. And the first and foremost thing is just how, uh, since your face isn't shown, it's what, what remains to be seen. So it's like all the body language is basically put under a microscope. Like, so like all your movements, your facial expressions just don't matter this time with an actual mask. Right? Uh, so I was really trying to be as precise and as intricate with all the little you know, head tilts and, and everything that I was trying to do. Uh, just every little motion I was just paying absolute focus and attention to. Um, that being said, I was also blind or visually <laughs> impaired due to trying to see through burlap a lot. Of time. So sometimes I had to be extra uh, attentive where my arms and legs were because you know, if I try and run across the street at night with a sack over my head, you know, I could break a toe, you know, not trip over the curb or something, which almost happened once, I think. But I uh, was a lot of awareness of what all my extremities are doing. I I just wanted to say one other thing about my mask work was that um, this was not a uh, normal, normal special effects makeup would be glued to your face and it would be immovable and your muscles would have to move or your face wouldn't move at all. But that wasn't the case with my mask. My mask was attached at the forehead in a special kind of way that I'll tell you about if you come to my table. But the purpose of that is they wanted the bottom of the mask to be uh, freely moving. And what comes along with that is the, no the way, I'm sorry, the reason they use appliances that are glued to someone's face is so that it gets blended. They can blend it to the eye and it looks like the person's skin, but they did not want that either in my case. So the eyes were eye holes and it was clear that they were, s the mask skin was separate from my eye, but they had to make up, they had to blood up that eye around the skin mask <laughs> so that it looked normal. You can't have a bloody face and then a glaring white skin eye underneath, right? It just it would look weird. So they had to put makeup on it. And in the makeup test for that, uh, <laughs> you know, part of a makeup test is working out all the problems. Well, one of the problems that presented itself is they had blooded up my personal skin around my eyes so much and it was so hot where we were shooting that when I started to sweat, all that blood went into my eyes, and it was quite, uh, I mean, it was 